Hi, and welcome back. Today I'm reading Kidnapped, chapters five and six. Chapter five, I go to the Queen's Ferry. Much rain fell in the night, and the next morning there blew a bitter wintry wind out of the northwest, driving scattered clouds. For all that, and before the sun began to peep or the last of the stars had vanished, I made my way to the side of the burn and had a plunge in a deep whirling pool. All aglow from my bath, I sat down once more beside the fire, which I replenished, and began gravely to consider my position. There was now no doubt about my uncle's enmity. There was no doubt I carried my life in my hand, and he would leave no stone unturned that he might compass my destruction. But I was young and spirited, and like most lads that have been country bred, I had a great opinion of my shrewdness. I had come to his door no better than a beggar and little more than a child. He had met me with treachery and violence. It would be a fine consummation to take the upper hand and drive him like a herd of sheep. I sat there nursing my knee and smiling at the fire, and I saw myself in fancy smell out his secrets one after another and grow to be that man's king and ruler. The warlock of Essendine, they say, had made a mirror in which men could read the future. It must have been of other stuff than burning coal, for in all the shapes and pictures that I sat and gazed at, there was never a ship, never a seaman with a hairy cap, never a big bludgeon for my silly head, or the least sign of all those tribulations that were ripe to fall on me. Presently, all swollen with conceit, I went upstairs and gave my prisoner his liberty. He gave me good morning civilly, and I gave the same to him, smiling down upon him from the heights of my sufficiency. Soon we were set to breakfast as it might have been the day before. Well, sir, said I with a jeering tone, have you nothing more to say to me? And then, as he made no articulate reply, it will be time, I think, to understand each other, I continued. You took me for a country Johnny Raw with no more motherwit or courage than a porridge stick. I took you for a good man or no worse than others at the least. It seems we were both wrong. What cause you have to fear me, to chast me, and to attempt my life? He murmured something about a jest and that he liked a bit of fun, and then seeing me smile, changed, changed his tone and assured me he would make all clear as soon as we had breakfasted. I saw by his face that he had no lie ready for me, though he was hard at work preparing one. And I think I was about to tell him so when we were interrupted by a knocking at the door. Bidding my uncle sit where he was, I went to open it and found on the doorstep a half-grown boy in sea clothes. <clears throat> Excuse me. He had no sooner seen me than he began to dance some steps of the sea hornpipe, which I had never heard of before heard of, far less seen, snapping his fingers in the air and footing it right cleverly. For all that, he was blue with the cold, and there was something in his face, a look between tears and laughter that was highly pathetic and consisted ill with his gaiety of manner. What cheer, mate, says he with a cracked voice. I asked him soberly to name his pleasure. Oh, pleasure, says he, and then began to sing. For it's my delight of a shiny night in the season of the year. Well, said I, if you have no business at all, I will even be so unmannerly as to shut you out. Stay, brother, he cried. Have you no fun about you? Or do you want to get me thrashed? I've brought a letter from old Heasy Ozy to Mr. Bellflower. He showed me a letter as he spoke. And I say, mate, he added, I'm mortal hungry. Well, said I, come into the house and you shall have a bite if I go empty for it. With that, I brought him in and set him down to my own place where he fell too greedily on the remains of breakfast, winking to me between whiles and making many faces, which I think the poor soul considered manly. Meanwhile, my uncle had read the letter and sat thinking. Then suddenly, he got to his feet with a great air of liveliness and pulled me apart into the farthest corner of the room. Read that, said he, and put the letter in my hand. Here it is lying before me as I write. The Haws Inn at the Queen's Ferry. Sir, I lie here with my hawser up and down and send my cabin boy to inform. If you have any further commands for overseas, today will be the last occasion, as the wind will serve us well out of the firth. <clears throat> I will not seek to deny that I have had crosses with your doer, Mr. Rankiller, of which, if not speedily read up, you may look to see some losses follow. I have drawn a bill upon you as per margin, and am, sir, your most obedient, humble servant." Elias Hoseason. 
You see, Davy, resumed my uncle as soon as he saw that I had done, I have a venture with this man, Hoseason, the captain of a trading brig, the Covenant of Dysart. Now, if you and me was to walk over with yon lad, I could see the captain at the Hawes or maybe on board the Covenant if there was papers to be signed. And so far from a loss of time, we can jog on to the lawyer, Mr. Rankeeler's. After all that's come and gone, you would be swire to believe me upon my naked word, but you'll believe Rankeiler. He's factor to half the gentry in these parts, an old man forby, highly respect it, and he kenned your father. I stood a while and thought. I was going to some place of shipping, which was doubtless populous, and where my uncle durst attempt no violence, and indeed even the society of the cabin boys so far protected me. Once there, I believed I could force on the visit to the lawyer, even if my uncle were now insincere in proposing it, and perhaps, in the bottom of my heart, I wished a nearer view of the sea and ships. <clears throat> Excuse me. You are to remember that I lived all my life in the inland hills, and just two days before I had my first sight of the Firth lying like a blue floor, and the sailed ships moving on the face of it no bigger than toys. One thing with another I made up my mind. Very well, says I. Let us go to the ferry. <clears throat> my uncle got into his hat and coat and buckled an old rusty cutlass on, and then we trod the fire out, locked the door, and set forth upon our walk. The wind, being in that cold quarter the northwest, blew nearly in our faces as we went. It was the month of June. The grass was all white with daisies and the trees with blossom, but to judge by our blue nails and aching wrists, the time might have been winter and the whiteness a December frost. Uncle Ebenezer trudged in the ditch, jogging from side to side like an old plowman coming home from work. He never said a word the whole way, and I was thrown for talk on the cabin boy. He told me his name was Ransom, and that he had followed the sea since he was nine, but could not say how old he was as he had lost his reckoning. He showed me tattoo marks bearing his breast in the teeth of the wind, and in spite of my remonstrances, for I thought it was enough to kill him. He swore horribly whenever he remembered, but more like a silly schoolboy than a man, and boasted of many wild and bad things that he had done. Stealthy thefts, false accusations, aye, and even murder but all with such a dearth of likelihood in the details and such a weak and crazy swagger in the delivery as disposed me rather to pity than to believe him. I asked him of the brig, which he declared was the finest ship that sailed, and of Captain Hoseason, in whose praises he was equally loud. He's the O.C., for so he still named the skipper, was a man by his account that minded for nothing either in heaven or earth, one that, as people said, would crack on all sail into the day of judgment, rough, fierce, unscrupulous, and brutal, and all this my poor cabin boy had taught himself to admire as something seamanlike and manly. He would only admit one flaw in his idol. He ain't no seaman, he admitted. That's Mr. Sean that navigates the brig. He's the finest seaman in the trade, only for drink, and I tell you I believe it. Why, look here, and turning down his stocking, he showed me a great raw red wound that made my blood run cold. He done that, Mr. Sean done it, he said with an air of pride. What, I cried, do you take such savage uses at his hands? Why, you are no slave to be so handled. No, said the poor moon calf, changing his tune at once, and so he'll find. See here, and he showed me a great case knife, which he told me was stolen. Oh, says he, let me see him try. I dare him to, I'll do for him. Oh, he ain't the first, and he confirmed it with a poor, silly, ugly oath. <clears throat> I have never felt such pity for any one in this wide world as I felt for that half-witted creature, and it began to come over me that the Brig Covenant, for all her pious name, was little better than a hell upon the seas. Have you no friends, said I? He said he had a father in some English seaport, I forget which. He was a fine man, too, he said, but he's dead. In heaven's name, cried I, can you find no reputable life on shore? Oh, no, says he, winking and looking very sly, they would put me to a trade. I know a trick worth two of that, I do. I asked him what trade could be so dreadful as the one he followed, where he ran the continual peril of his life, not alone from wind and sea, but by the horrid cruelty of those who were his masters. He said it was very true, and then began to praise the life and tell what a pleasure it was to get on shore with money in his pocket and spend it like a man and buy apples and swagger and surprise what he called stick-in-the-mud boys. And then it's not all as bad as that, says he. There's worse off than me. There's the twenty-pounders. Oh, laws, you should see them taking on. Why, I've seen a man as old as you, I dare say. To him I seemed old. Ah, and he had a beard, too. 
Well, and as soon as we cleared out of the river and he had the drug out of his head, my, how he cried and carried on. I made a fine fool of him, I tell you. And then there's little ones too. Oh, little by me. I tell you, I keep them in order. When we carry little ones, I have a rope's end of my own to wallop him. And so he ran on until it came in on me what he meant by twenty pounders were those unhappy criminals who were sent overseas to slavery in North America, or the still more unhappy innocents who were kidnapped or trepanned, as the word went, for private interest or vengeance. Just then we came to the top of the hill and looked down on the ferry and the hope. The Firth of Forth, as is very well known, narrows at this point to the width of a good-sized river, which makes a convenient ferry going north, and turns the upper reach into a landlocked haven for all manner of ships. Right in the midst of the narrows lies an islet with some ruins. On the south shore, they have built a pier for the service of the ferry, and at the end of the pier, on the other side of the road, and backed against a pretty garden of holly trees and hawthorns, I could see the building which they called the Hawes Inn. The town of Queensbury lies farther west, and the neighborhood of the inn looked pretty lonely at that time of day, for the boat had just gone north with passengers. A skiff, however, lay beside the pier with some seamen sleeping on the thwarts. This, as Ransom told me, was the brig's boat waiting for the captain, and about half a mile off and all alone in the anchorage, he showed me the covenant herself. There was a sea-going bustle on board. Yards were swinging into place, and as the wind blew from that quarter, I could hear the song of the sailors as they pulled upon the ropes. After all I had listened to upon the way, I looked at that ship with an extreme abhorrence and from the bottom of my heart I pitied all poor souls that were condemned to sail in her. We had all three pulled up the brow of the hill, and now I marched across the road and addressed my uncle. I think it right to tell you, sir, says I, there's nothing that will bring me on board that covenant. <clears throat> he seemed to waken from a dream. Eh, he said, what's that? I told him over again. Well, well, he said, we'll have to please you, I suppose, but what are we standing here for? It's perishing cold, and if I'm no mistaken, they're bu busking the covenant for sea. <clears throat> Chapter 6. What Befell at the Queen's Ferry As soon as we came to the inn, Ransom led us up the stair to a small room with a bed in it and heated like an oven by a great fire of coal. At a table hard by the chimney, a tall, dark, sober-looking man sat writing. In spite of the heat of the room, he wore a thick sea jacket buttoned to the neck and a tall, hairy cap drawn down over his ears. Yet I never saw any man, not even a judge upon the bench, look cooler or more studious and self-possessed than this ship captain. He got to his feet at once and, coming forward, offered his large hand to Ebenezer. "'I am proud to see you, Mr. Balfour,' said he, in a fine, deep voice, and glad that you're here in time. The wind's fair and the tide upon the turn. We'll see the old coal bucket burning on the Isle of May before tonight.' "'Captain Hoseason,' returned my uncle, "'you keep your room unco hot.' It's a habit I have, Mr. Balfour, said the skipper. I'm a cold, rife man by my nature. I have a cold blood, sir. There's neither fur nor flannel, no, sir, nor hot rum will warm up what they call the temperature. Sir, it's the same with most men that have been carbon carbonadoed, as they call it, in the tropic seas. Well, well, Captain, replied my uncle, we must all be the way we're made. But it chanced that this fancy of the captain's had a great share in my misfortunes. For though I had promised myself not to let my kinsman out of sight, I was both so impatient for a nearer look of the sea and so sickened by the closeness of the room that when he told me to run downstairs and play myself a while, I was fool enough to take him at his word. Away I went, therefore, leaving the two men sitting down to a bottle and a great mass of papers, and crossing the road in front of the inn, walked down upon the beach. With the wind in that quarter, only little wavelets, not much bigger than I had seen upon a lake, beat upon the shore. But the weeds were new to me, some green, some brown and long, and some with little bladders that crackled between my fingers. Even so far up the firth, the smell of the seawater was exceedingly salt and stirring. The covenant, besides, was beginning to shake out her sails, which hung upon the yards in clusters, and the spirit of all that I beheld put me in thoughts of far voyages and foreign places. I looked, too, at the seamen with the skiff. Big brown fellows, some in shirts, some with jackets, some with colored handkerchiefs about their throats, one with a brace of pistols stuck into his pockets, two or three with knotty bludgeons, and all with their case knives. I passed the time of day with one that looked less desperate than his fellows and asked him of the sailing of the brig. He said they would get under way as soon as the ebb set and express his gladness to be out of a port where there were no taverns and fiddlers, but all with such horrifying oaths that I made haste to get away from him. 
This threw me back on Ransom, who seemed the least wicked of that gang, and who soon came out of the inn and ran to me, crying for a bowl of punch. I told him I would give him no such thing, for neither he nor I was of an age for such indulgences. But a glass of ale you may have, and welcome, said I. He mopped and mowed at me and called me names, but he was glad to get the ale for all that, and presently we were set down at a table in the front room of the inn, and both eating and drinking with a good appetite. Here it occurred to me that as the landlord was a man of that country, I might do well to make a friend of him. I offered him a share, as was much the custom in those days, but he was far too great a man to sit with such poor customers as Ransom and myself, and he was leaving the room when I called him back to ask whether he knew Mr. Rankeeler. Hoot, aye, says he, and a very honest man, and oh, by the by, says he, was it you that came in with Ebenezer? And when I had told him yes, you'll be no friend of his, he asked, meaning in the Scottish way that I would be no relative. I told him no, none. I thought not, said he, and yet you have a kind of glyph of Mr. Alexander. I said it seemed that Ebenezer was ill seen in the country. Nay doubt, said the landlord, he's a wicked old man, and there's many would like to see him grinning in a toe. Janet Clauston and Money Mare that he has harried out of house and hame. And yet he was ance a fine young fellow, too. But that was before the sow gate abroad about Mr. Alexander, and that was like the death of him. And what was it, I asked? Oh, just that he had killed him, said the landlord. Did you never hear that? And what would he kill him for, said I? And what for, but just to get the place, said he. The place, said I, the Shaws? Nay, other place that I can, said he. I, man, said I, is that so? Was my, was Alexander the eldest son? Deed was he, said the landlord, what else would he have killed him for? And with that he went away, as he had been impatient to do from the beginning. Of course, I had guessed it a long while ago, but it is one thing to guess, another to know. And I sat stunned with my good fortune, and could scarce grow to believe that the same poor lad who had trudged in the dust from Ettrick Forest not two days ago was now one of the rich of the earth, and had a house and broad lands, and might mount his horse tomorrow. All these pleasant things, and a thousand others, crowded into my mind, as I sat staring before me out of the inn window, and paying no heed to what I saw. Only I remember that my eyes lighted on Captain Hoseason down on the pier among his seamen, and speaking with some authority. And presently he, he came marching back toward the house, with no mark of a sailor's clumsy, clumsiness, but carrying his fine, tall figure with a manly bearing, and still with the same sober, grave expression on his face. I wondered if it was possible that Ransom's stories could be true, and half disbelieved them. They fitted so ill with the man's looks. But indeed, he was neither so good as I supposed him, nor quite so bad as Ransom did. For, in fact, he was two men, and left the better one behind as soon as he set foot on board his vessel. The next thing, I heard my uncle calling me, and found the pair in the road together. It was the captain who addressed me, and that with an air very flattering to a young lad, of grave equality. Sir, said he, Mr. Balfour tells me great things of you, and for my own part, I like your looks. I wish I was for longer here that we might make the better friends, but we'll make the most of what we have. Ye shall come on board my brig for half an hour till the ebb sets and drink a bowl with me. Now I longed to see the inside of a ship more than words can tell, but I was not going to put myself in jeopardy, and I told him my uncle and I had an appointment with a lawyer. Aye, aye, said he. He passed me word of that. But you see, the boat'll set ye ashore at the town pier, and that's but a penny stone cast from Rankeeler's house. And here he suddenly leaned down and whispered in my ear, Take care of the old Todd. He means mischief. Come aboard till I can get a word with you. And then, passing his arm through mine, he continued aloud as he set off toward his boat. But come, what can I bring you from the Carolinas? Any friend of Mr. Balfour's can command. A roll of tobacco? Indian featherwork? A skin of a wild beast? A stone pipe? The mockingbird that mews for all the world like a cat? The cardinal bird that it is red, that is as red as blood? Take your pick and say your pleasure. By this time, we were at the boat side and he was handing me in. I did not dream of hanging back. I thought, the poor fool, that I had found a good friend and helper, and I was rejoiced to see the ship. As soon as we were all set in our places, the boat was thrust off from the pier and began to move over the waters. And what with my pleasure in this new movement and my surprise at our low position and the appearances of the shores, and the growing bigness of the brig as we drew near to it, I could hardly understand what the captain said and must have answered him at random. 
As soon as we were alongside, where I sat fairly gasping at the ship's height, the strong humming of the tide against its sides, and the pleasant cries of the seamen at their work, Hoseason, declaring that he and I must be the first aboard, ordered a tackle to be sent down from the main yard. In this I was whipped into the air and set down again on the deck, where the captain stood ready, waiting for me, and instantly slipped back his arm under mine. There I stood some while, a little dizzy with the unsteadiness of all around me, perhaps a little afraid, and yet vastly pleased with these strange sights. The captain, meanwhile, pointing out the strangest and telling me their names and uses. "'But where's my uncle?' said I suddenly. "'Aye,' said Hoseason, with a sudden grimness. "'That's the point.' I felt I was lost. With all my strength, I plucked myself clear of him and ran to the bulwarks. Sure enough, there was the boat pulling for the town with my uncle sitting in the stern. I gave a piercing cry, help, help, murder, so that both sides of the anchorage rang with it, and my uncle turned round where he was sitting and showed me a face full of cruelty and terror. It was the last I saw. Already strong hands had been plucking me back from the ship's side, and now a thunderbolt seemed to strike me. I saw a great flash of fire and fell senseless. Thank you for listening today. I'll see you next time.